Hello, this is David Bishai, and I'm here to give a short lecture on conceptualizing dynamic and interactive health system elements. I'm going to talk today about there being two roads that diverge. This echoes an old Robert Frost poem called The Road Not Taken. So we're going to talk about the road that everybody is taking. That's the road on the left. If we go down this road, we see the sickness care system. And in healthcare systems, this is very familiar. And if we go down the bottom of the stairs, we see the six building blocks. This is a famous concept of the World Health Organization, which says to analyze health systems, we think of six building blocks, human resources, governance, quality, supplies, financing, and health services. This idea tells us that we should focus on these blocks. In economics, we talk about there being different utility functions for each block, and each block is playing a non-cooperative game. They have to coordinate their activities, and they do that by trading with one another. What do they want to maximize? In economics, we say that the patient is trying to maximize a utility function based on health and consumption. The provider is maximizing a utility function based on profit, leisure, and patient health. Nonprofit hospitals want to maximize perhaps the number of patients served or their reputation or both. We know what insurers and drug companies want to pursue. In the private sector, they are pursuing profit. The regulator has a very complex objective function. They want to maximize some uh, combination of the time in office and some defined social objective. Now, when we think about how that building block system interacts with what causes disease, we want to think a little bit about the modern burden of disease. We know that we do still have the, the problems of infectious diseases like Ebola and mosquito-borne illness, but we also have the common problems in non-communicable diseases like sugar and fatty donuts, bacon, tobacco, racism, uh, human oppression, automobile crashes, the uh, unhealthy diet with salt and, and trans fats in the diet. This is what makes people get sick, but they're out of scope for the sickness care system. Doctors and pharmacies are very, very little to offer to prevent these things from causing poor health. So what happens? Our friend Joe is going to get sick, and now the sickness care system jumps into action does its transacted trades, moves dollars around in these building blocks of financing, governance, and supplies, etc. And wonderful news, Joe is cured. He feels immense gratitude. Who else is grateful? Well, very clearly, there are a lot of transactions in the system, and drug companies are very grateful, and surgeons, and hospitals, and even the community of healthcare system scientists that gets to analyze the failures of the system are very grateful that the sickness care system has so many transacted trades. And here they are. This whole team is very important because in the transacted trades, what's special about the sickness care system is that the horizontal person in this picture has a lot more at stake than the vertical people in the picture. The horizontal one is much more likely to have a poor health outcome today, and the surgical team is probably going to end the day healthy. They don't share the risk, but they are bound together uh, through their ability to trade resources. So this idea of the sickness care system is resilient. It's a good idea. We do need a sickness care system, but I want everybody to notice that commodification of health by goods and services has occurred. The idea that one becomes healthy by acquiring services and products is common and hard to shake. The other idea that we've gone over is that these building blocks that don't really solve a cooperative game so much as a non-cooperative transacted game, and each of them maximizing their own objectives, that's actually a good first approximation. Now we want to move on to a health system that can actually tell us something about the issues that face poor population health, these issues such as racism, poverty, housing, justice, and self-harm. Many people in health say if you start talking about things like that, we no longer think we can offer anything and we want to go back to the shelter and comfort of the sickness care system. So here are two people having a conversation. One on the left says, don't worry, 
Six building blocks has it covered. We've already included governance and the quality blocks in the building block framework. The man on the right says, I want you to think about a jigsaw puzzle. A jigsaw puzzle has blocks, but it is not governed and really has no quality until the pieces are put together. Look at my new earring, and out here on his ear, he's wearing uh, a jigsaw puzzle, which has the need to be put together and have its pieces interlinked and interact with each other. So we can do better than the six building block paradigm. That paradigm obstructs the realization that coherence lies in the relationships between the building blocks. Let's go back to the branch in the road. We took the road on the left, we saw the sickness care system. Now let's take the road on the right and see something bigger, the health system. If we go up here, we're still surrounded by this whirlwind of bacon and mosquitoes and donuts and cigarettes and racism, and what are we going to do? Are we going to run away and say we can't handle it? Let's go back to sickness? No. We can go forward, and here we go to the public health profession. This is a workforce that is devoted to helping society create the conditions in which people can be healthy. The profession works in both the public sector and the private sector. There are 60,000 districts on the planet. Just about every, 60, every one of the 60,000 has a health department. For instance, the Boston City has the Boston Public Health Commission devoted to carrying out the public health profession for Boston. These do not need to be created. These units exist already. What do they do? Well, they go around the public health cycle. This is the foundation of a responsive, people-centered health system. It has three main elements. First, to assess the health of the population and what are the health threats. Then to develop policy based on that assessment. Policy development is both done in a technocratic way, where very smart people come up with solutions, but it is importantly done in a collaborative, bottom-up way, where the people and their stakeholders are engaged in understanding the health threats and building, through crowdsourcing, a response to the health problems of the community. Then together, the entire community can build solutions that are going to assure the health of the population. Now, some of these are technocratic top-down solutions that only engineers and specialists can, can undertake. But many of these solutions to public health threats are for lay people, organizations from a vast variety of sectors and walks of life can help to assure. Let's talk about these three parts of the public health cycle. First is assessment. What is hurting us here in this place? Why is this happening to us? These are basic questions in epidemiology and social epidemiology, and every community needs to have the ability to assess these questions. Assessment includes participatory community assessment. It includes having the, the people involved in knowing what the health threats are. Policy development answers the question, what can we do, with the emphasis on we. It includes a we made up of citizens, technical experts, politicians, religious communities, schools, universities, etc. They all have to be part of the understanding of the problem and come together to help address policy. They're in a conversation. That conversation begins with local data. It begins with a review of what has worked to solve these problems elsewhere. This is a facilitated conversation so that the priorities reflect a consensus among the parties. This is not easy. There will be power imbalances and there will be groups that try to dominate this conversation for their personal advantage. There needs to be solidarity across these multiple groups and a creation of shared identity based on shared threats. That's the difference between the sickness care system where the surgical team was going to be healthy and the surgical patient might not have been. When we're in public health, everybody is sharing the threats to health. Everybody breathes the air and eats the food and moves around on the roadway. These are shared threats and however we tend to lose sight of that and believe that health is created through personal action and that the risks are not shared broadly. When we share these risks and know that we are actually sharing a food environment, a social discriminatory environment, an environment 
where mosquitoes fly around across all of us and, and spread disease, that can create a conversation that can create opportunities. We need to institutionalize this shared understanding. We need to answer the question, who can convene these multiple stakeholders? How can we strategically get the invitation so that domination of the agenda by the powerful will not occur? And how can we facilitate a conversation when a community is divided? That institutionalization will be different in different contexts. But every time we do build institutionalization, we are relying on the public health profession to have the ability to do this important task. It's part of their practice. What is the deliverable? It is the coherence of dozens of these building blocks, not just six, building blocks from across society that contribute solutions. This is a conversation that can start inching up something called the Overton window. The Overton window is an idea that ideas move through a cycle from first being unthinkable to being radical, to being acceptable, to being sensible, to popular, to policy. And very often the things we want to do in public health, many of them are right now unthinkable. And many of the things we take for granted in public health used to be unthinkable. It used to be unthinkable that there would be public sanitation. The Paris Accord was once unthinkable. The idea that we would put taxes on one of the most lucrative products in the history of business, protected by one of the most powerful lobbying agencies, and now we can put tobacco taxes on. Before the U.S. Civil Rights Movement, no one could imagine racial justice coming to America. Current strategies in needle exchange or food labeling, these are all ideas that were once unthinkable, but through public health action have moved up into the Overton window where we need them to stay. There's pressure to move them out of the window and back into unthinkability. And this is really what the conversation is necessary for. It's not possible to come in as an engineer and do everything you want if we're not constantly playing uh, the game of social consensus. Finally, in the public health cycle, we have to do assurance of these public health policies. Now, there is definitely a government role for better enforcement, as well as the development of new regulations. The government is necessary for public works to control mosquitoes, to improve water, to improve the safety of nutrition. There's a need for social consensus and surveillance that what the government's doing is working. There's a need for public finance for many of these activities, opening up the fiscal space to prevent disease. And we need social programs that only the government can do for housing and jobs and families. There's also a very important private role. Many of these social goods can be provided voluntarily around the world. We have community health volunteers that are privately helping to assure solutions. Individual businesses are responsible for the quality and safety of their workplace, not just the physical safety, but the social safety, and to offer non-discriminatory, uh, respectable living conditions and working conditions. Livelihoods need to be generated by the private sector. The creation of human capital through education and schooling, the creation of living spaces, these are all private activities that there is just not enough budget for in the government. What are our insights? Number one, people all do not want to become sick. Another insight is that we often respond better to narratives of threat rather than the epidemiological data about what is going to hurt us. And the narratives of what can hurt us might not be aligned with data, or they might be. It's the job of public health to create the narratives that do align with the data on what is really hurting us. Throughout human history, we have achieved all of civilization by seeking and achieving solidarity against threats. So this is not new. This is old human behavior to find out what is trying to hurt us and gather together to countervene it. Final idea is that we are defining and redefining who we ally with on a continual basis. The definition of who is in a tribe is plastic. It is easy to redefine. And what we want to do in public health is redefine the idea of a social unit or a tribe based around the idea of who is sharing a health risk. These are all working to our favor in the practice of public health. 
So how do we model what we're doing? How do we use complex adaptive systems to model a cooperative game? First, we want to show who the players are, who are the, the operators in this public health cycle, and show how they actually have a reason to cooperate because they share risk. What complementarities do they share? How do they work together and how do they need each other? And finally, what catalyzes their cooperation? And I would put forth that there actually has to be action by the public health actors to make the cooperation happen. This will not be automatic. It's too easy to forget about prevention and too easy to focus all of our attention on curing the sick. So we need to sustain the cycle of assessing and policy development and assurance. We need a workforce that knows that it is their job to do that cycle. They will fight the forces that are going to arise to erode and divide the tribe as it begins to address the cycle. So how do we get that? Bottom line, the foundation is the local capacity to do that practice. In the USA, we have a public health accreditation board for health departments. In the hospitals of the USA, we have a community health needs assessment obligation for every hospital. And in districts around the world, there is perhaps an under-implemented expectation that the district health officers will be doing the cycle uh, that I've just laid out in the essential public health functions. Now, are we going to leave behind the six building blocks? Do they still relate to this? And the answer is, of course they relate to this. Here they are. Inside that public health cycle of assessment, developing policy and assurance, there are the six building blocks. That entire sickness care system is a part of this. It's sitting there in the assurance wing. All of the sickness care system is still here. We still need it. It's just it's a small part of what we need to think about in responding to disease. So what have we gone over today? In summary, the health system subsumes a sickness care system. The sickness care system is driven by a sense of urgency from needy patients. There is this attractive narrative in the sickness care system of miracles and cures, and there's a lot of money. That's going to lead to fragmentation, and the money and marketization is going to keep our attention focused on the sickness care system. Outside and around and pervading the sickness care system is the real health system. This health system requires coherence to do its job and to keep us tuned in to preventing population level health problems. And here we get our coherence from a cycle of assessment, developing policy, and assuring that coherence requires the engagement of the whole community because the whole community shares the risk. We need new narratives and stories about how those risks are shared. So to back up, we talked about two roads that diverged. And we know the road on the left is the one more traveled by. And today I hope that we've paid a little more attention to how systems thinking can lead us to engage with the road on the right. Thank you very much for listening.